Well, hello everyone. How's it going? So first of all, I want to thank the North Carolina Ultrasound Society for having me as part of their conference. It's a great honor for me. Uh, hopefully in the future, I'll be there in person. So today we are going to go over pediatric gastrointestinal sonography. Now pediatrics, because I work in a pediatric hospital and that's most of my experience, especially with GI ultrasound. However, a lot of this stuff is applicable to adults. All right, so the lecture, lecture objectives are, we're going to go over basic anatomy overview of the gastrointestinal system, some techniques, and then finally the pathology that you can see with ultrasound in the gut. All right, so the transducers we use are just like any other abdominal application, you know, primarily for the upper abdomen, especially if you want to include organs like pancreas, liver, stuff like that, you're going to use the curved probe. Um... Now, the ones that I like to use most for gastrointestinal ultrasound is the linear, especially the 9L here. This is very good for appendix, you know, cecum, colon, small bowel, obviously looking for free fluid, things like that too. And uh, on smaller or slimmer patients, you could even use a 15 megahertz linear transducer and get really, really nice pictures with that. The, there's a new uh, probe on the GE Logic E10 that has it goes up to 24 megahertz. Now, obviously, on a bigger person, you're not going to be able to get beautiful views of you know gastrointestinal structures. But if you're doing like a, a baby, you're going to be able to get some amazing, amazing high resolution images. So first, let's go over gut signature. So gut signature is a son sonographic and histologic term. It refers to the five layers of the bowel. Now, you don't have to remember the actual layers. I typically, I, you know, when, when I do a diagram like that, it helps me remember. But, you know, if I tend to forget, I'll focus on the middle layer, which is the submucosal, which is the hyperechoic layer. Now, the five layers usually go from bright to dark. So hyperechoic, hypoechoic, hyperechoic, hypoechoic, and then hyperechoic. So the inner layer is the mucosa, which is this hyper or echogenic layer. Then a darker hypoechoic layer is the muscularis mucosa. Then the echogenic layer, which is the middle layer, the one I remember, because when there's gut, uh, when there's bowel wall thickening, that that one tends to pre predominate. It gets real thick. So that's the sub submucosa, which is echogenic. Then the muscularis propria, which is hypoechoic. And then finally the serosa or outer layer, which is also echogenic. All right. So remember, hypo, hyper, hypo, or hyper, hypo. You get it. So this is pretty much like the stomach area, close to the antrum. You can see a little lymph node. Now this is with a linear transducer. You can get very, very high detailed pictures. And the lumen of the stomach was filled with fluid, which kind of helps you see the layers. If there's a lot of gas in the intestines, you might not be able to see the gut signature, at least circumferentially. All right, so let's go over peristalsis. So peristalsis is an involuntary intestinal muscular contraction that's, you know, it's uh, controlled by the autonomic nervous system and it creates wave-like movements in the canal of the, of the intestines to propel the stomach contact, contents and intestinal contents forward. Oftentimes you've, you'll notice that if you're, blah, 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 you hear your stomach grumbling, that's peristalsis that's happening. I forgot that this video had a had a music, very soulful. So here you can see a surgical view of peristalsis, and then here you got small bowel. I remember that's echogenic. You saw right there that's peristalsis, and there again. This is important to note because if there is ileus or bowel paralysis, you saw that right there. So that's. Or if there's a small bowel obstruction, you're going to have a lack of peristalsis. So it's very important to be able to recognize. All right. So honestly, the gastrointestinal system begins in the mouth. You know, the tongue, the salivary glands create saliva, which begin the digestion process. Obviously, the teeth chew the food, which begins the digestive process. Then it goes down the esophagus, into the stomach, and so forth. So here you got a transverse view at the level of the thyroid. Usually you see the esophagus posterior to the left lobe of the thyroid, which is right here. So here's your carotid, isthmus of the thyroid, left lobe, esophagus. Here's your sternocleidomastoid, and here's the trachea. So it'll be posterior to the left lobe and lateral to the trachea. 
Sometimes it'll be it'll be behind the trachea. You won't be able to see it. But usually you can see it here, especially in skinny or younger patients. And then a longitudinal view right here. So here you got vertebrae, right? The esophagus. You see the gut signature. The lumen will be right here. You can see air bubbles inside the lumen. And then the left lobe of the thyroid. In this view, you can ask the patient to swallow. You can see the, the saliva and the air that's swallowed going down. So that's also good to know because when you're doing a thyroid ultrasound, if you're inexperienced, you may see this and be like, oh, there's a lesion there. Maybe a parathyroid lesion, but no, it's the esophagus. So the esophagus goes into the stomach. All right. It's so what separates the esophagus from the stomach is the esophageal sphincter. All right. So then you have the fundus, the rugal folds here, the body and the antrum. So once the stomach contents chewed food and liquid gets to the antrum, it'll pass through the pyloric or pylorus, and then into the first part of the duodenum. So here is an image of a baby. Obviously, you can see stomach because I put the word stomach on it. Very filled. So here would be the antrum right here. This is antrum, antrum, body, body, and then the fundus is down here. And here's your pylorus. I think this patient had pyloric stenosis because it's very thickened. So distended stomach with pyloric stenosis. With pyloric stenosis, when you have that, the stomach contents can get past, so you'll feed and feed and feed. Eventually, you have projectile vomiting because the contractions won't allow the food to go where it's supposed to go. So it'll go in reverse, retrograde out the mouth. Another important thing about this when you're doing abdominal ultrasounds, especially on little kids and babies, and you're inexperienced, you might be getting the left kidney and the spleen, and sometimes you'll see a circular mass with fluid inside of it. It may look like a cyst, especially if there's no peristalsis. But be aware that that's probably the stomach if you have air in there. So, you know, get uh, comfortable or used to recognizing the stomach in the left upper quadrant, especially if there's a lot of fluid. All right. So the pylorus, that pylorus is the end of the stomach. So you have this, the antrum, the pyloric antrum, and then the pylorus, which is another sphincter. So you have the esoph esophageal sphincter and pyloric sphincter. It's a circular valve or a circular muscular ring that keeps the the stomach contents in the stomach for long enough for some of the digestive enzymes to start doing their work and the saliva, and then it'll propel it towards the first part of the duodenum. So here's the antrum. You see here is a lot of air, so you can't see. You see the gut signature, remember? Submucosa is the echogenic portion. You can see a lot of just dirty shadowing because there's air inside the, the stomach. There's some more air here. And then this is the pylorus here. So pyloric antrum. The pyloric sphincter would be this portion right here. This is the first part of the duodenum. If there is no fluid in the duodenum, you're just going to see air. But this is a normal pyloric with some, so some liquid and air. If you're going to measure it, you'd measure from here to here. You want to measure the, the muscularis portion, not from here to here. Here's a higher resolution vid, uh, image. This is 15 megahertz. Again, stomach, pyloric channel. Uh, you can see the fluid there, and you can see the first part of the duodenum collapse, no fluid, and then the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is always a good marker or landmark for the pyloric, as is the, the pancreas. And here's a little clip of stomach contents going through the pylorus. So here you got the pyloric, food, and you can see all the little air bubbles, and that's the sphincter right here. And you see the fluid going through. There's a normal pylorus. And that's what you want to see. Obviously, you see there's a lot of movement. That's the baby breathing and crying. So you're not going to get a very still image. You're going to get a lot of motion artifacts, but you can see the fluid going there very clearly. All right, the small intestine. Small intestines, uh, the length varies from 9 feet to 34 feet. So it's a small intestine, but it is a long uh, piece of, of tissue or organ. It's pretty long. It's had a lot of folds. Uh, once food enters the small intestine, it mixes with secretions that neutralize the acids and allows for nutrients to be absorbed. Most of the nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine, including you know, vitamins, uh, lipids, uh, uh, glucose, fructose, things like that. Uh, digestive enzymes enter through the duodenum's ampulla of Vader, so you know the common bile duct goes and enters the duodenum. And then uh, the pancreatic enzy enzymes and the bile from the gallbladder go into there to allow to, to begin the digestion of fats and sugars. Is this a clip? Nope, but this is not a clip, but this is fluid filled bowel. In real time, you'll see a lot of peristalsis there. It's normal, the wall is very thin. You can see the gut signature, but not as well as you can on, on the other image. 
And then you have the large intestine, which is shorter, but it's large because it's got a you know bigger caliber. Now, the length is typically about five feet. It begins here in the cecum. So you have the ileocecal junction, then the cecum. From the cecum comes the appendix. And then you have the ascending colon, the hepatic flexure, the transverse colon, the splenic flexure, descending colon, and then the sigmoid colon, and finally the rectum, and then out to the external world. Now, usually you see an anatomical images like this that are very clear. The intestine just follows that typical pattern. But in real time, you know, there's a lot of variation that I can dip all the way down. It's not going to be as clear as this. Now, one thing you want to... Uh, know to differentiate between small bowel and large bowel or large intestine is haustra. So haustra are these little pouches right here that you can see. And you can kind of see them here, right here, right here. Small intestine doesn't have haustra. Another thing that large intestine has is the tinea coli, which is this band of tissue right here. Now, if you were to get longitudinal on the large intestine and then kind of uh, scroll or angle Laterally, you can, you know, if there's not a lot of air or gas obscuring your view, you can see the tinea coli. So that's something to consider. I don't know if I have, a, I think I have a picture of it. So, yeah. So here's large intestine. Clearly, you can see the, the haustra filled with fluid and, and, and food material. Not a lot of air, so that's good because it allows you to see the lumen. It allows you to see that there is no thickening of the intestine, like colitis or whatever. And then you have the small intestine, which looks much different. Usually just little loops of bowel with a lot of peristalsis and then the large intestine when you angle outward you can start to see a little bit of the, of the tinea coli right here okay so you don't have to show that or that's just some a, a good landmark to know that you are on the large intestine now also you have the appendix epiploica so these little appendages epiploic appendages also important because those can twist off and become inflamed causing epiploic appendagitis which we will go over later All right, bowel, if it's not completely filled with, uh, with dense feces, is compressible. So that's important for your small intestine, your large intestine, especially your appendix. If you can't compress it, it's because there is distended with, with feces and or fluid. But if it's not, you can see here you have a picture of the large bowel. You see the haustra, you see the submucosa right here, and then that's it compressed. This is the psoas muscle. So a little pressure, and you can see that compress. All right, so the protocol, this is a video, but I'm just going to explain it because it, it has a little transducer going. So if you're doing bowel ultrasound, let's say, for instance, an ultrasound for instance, exception. What I do, some people go kind of like this way. What I do is I'll do a counterclockwise scan. So I'll begin in the hypo, uh, epigastric region, take sagittal and transverse images there. You want to get a little bit of the left lobe of the liver. You also want to get some of the intestine in that area. There you're going to see transverse colon. Then you have the right upper quadrant. There you can see a little bit of gallbladder, a little bit of uh, hepatic and uh, renal interface, and then also angle a little bit down to the right lumbar region. I still mark it right over quadrant. And then uh, look at the bowel. There you see ascending colon, hepatic flexure, if there's not too much uh, air or gas. Then the right iliac uh, region, right lower quadrant. There you're going to see the cecum, the ileocecal junction. You're going to see the appendix which has a lot of variability, which we'll go over that later. Hypogastric region there, you're primarily looking at the bladder and then seeing if there's any free fluid around the bladder. You're going to see a lot of small intestine there. Then left lower quadrant, you're going to see a sigmoid colon if you can. You're also going to see if there's any free fluid, some small bowel you might see there. You're also going to see in the left lumbar region, which I'll still uh, label left lower quadrant, you'll see the psoas muscle, a descending colon, maybe some small bowel. And then the left upper quadrant, or left hypochondriac region, you're going to see spleen, left kidney, stomach, if it's filled with fluid, if it's filled with gas, you're just going to see a lot of gas in that region. Uh, hepatic flexure, a little bit of the transverse colon. So that's pretty much the protocol I do just counterclockwise. And then the umbilical region, there you can see mostly small bowel. You'll be able to see, especially at the level of the umbilicus, you'll be able to see the aorta and its bifurcation, the IVC, if there's not too much gas. You can't see if there's any free fluid. You, you will see a lot of small bowel there. Also, umbilical hernias are extremely common, especially in babies. You, you can't see that there. So here's a little clip explaining the ileocecal junction, small bowel versus large bowel. A lot of people ask about how to tell the difference between the ileum and the cecum or find the ileocecal junction. And here's 
very clear clip. So here's ilium. Here's a little bit of appendix. So ilium, a little bit of appendix, and here you got the ilium one more into the cecum. So here's right there. Here's another clip that shows it clear. So here's ilium, terminal ilium, psoas muscle, terminal ilium. Boom! Right there goes into the cecum. So ileocecal junction is right there. So ilium, cecum with gas and air and food products, and the junction is right there. All right, so yeah, that's the ileocecal junction right there. So terminal ilium, cecum, or first part of the ascending colon. And you can kind of see how the cecum kind of like wraps around the ilium. And the ilium kind of inserts itself into the into the colon. And that's also why it's important to know about ileocolic interceptions. So there's a lesion here, a lymph node most usually, like that gets caught in the peristalsis of this pouch here. It's going to keep on peristalsing, peristalsing. Then this ilium will go all the way up into the ascending colon and cause a ileocolic interception, which we'll go over later. A lot of people ask about All right, so now let's go over some pathology. All right, beginning in the stomach. Now, quite frankly, uh, you're not going to see a lot of gastric pathology. That's going to be more an endoscopic diagnosis or CT, MRI, things like that. But this is a three-month-old with a 20-centimeter intraluminal lesion of the stomach. You here is see is complex with cystic and solid portions and very hyperechoic portions and then portions and then fluid. Here is it is in, in ultrasound with some very dense oh, in ultrasound. I'm sorry in CT with some very dense structures here. And here's a pathological specimen. And here's another another CT with a contrast and this turned out to be a immature gastric teratoma now i've never seen one of these this is from a case report it's kind of cutting it off but it's from yoon et al uh from the korean journal of radiology and from 2000 the issue from 2000 october to december so oftentimes you're just gonna see the stomach filled with air every now and then you can see if there's like duodenitis or inflammation of the duodenum, you can see that, but that's obviously beyond the stomach. That's past the pylorus. Uh, gastritis, I've never seen it, but potentially I believe you can if the, the gastric wall is very really thick. But that can be a little difficult to diagnose with ultrasound because if the stomach is empty, has no contents in it, but does have a little bit of fluid, it's going to be decompressed and the wall is going to be thicker. So if you measure the wall and say, let's, let's say it's greater than three millimeters, let's say, and it's considered thickened, uh, that could be a false diagnosis. So we don't do a lot of gastric or stomach pathology with ultrasound, but I just wanted to share this interesting case. So Bezoar or Bezoar, I believe it's pronounced Bezoar, but I like Bezoar better, but it doesn't matter. So a Bezoar is a mass of partially digested or undigested material. And there's three types, right? So this material, it's something you're eating or ingesting your body really doesn't digest it or break it down. And if you eat too much of it, it will collect and form like a little ball that will take the shape of your intestine or of your stomach and can cause a uh, an obstruction, an intestinal or gastric obstruction. So surgical emergency. There's three types. Phytobezoars right here, which is this. That's plant material. So there's some cultures that eat, let's say, for instance, a lot of, uh, I think there's been cases of someone who ate a lot of coconut. And coconut is very, very fibrous. And if you eat enough of it and doesn't don't allow it to pass through your, your gut, it can collect forming a mass of coconut, a coconut mass, if you will. And then that will cause an obstruction. So phyto, phyto means plant, phytobezoars, which I think this is one of those. And then you have trichobezoars. So there's people that have trichotillomania. Those are people that pull their hair and ingest them. If you do that enough, your body can't digest that. And if you do it enough and it collects and collects, it will form a cast of whatever uh, structure, intestinal structure it's in. If it's in the stomach, it will form a cast of the stomach and it'll be a mass of hair that needs to be surgically removed. Uh, now these things will be very, very hard to see with ultrasound, you know, but to be aware of this and have something that, you know, draws your attention, perhaps you can uh, mention it to the radiologist and then they can have some uh, other exams to prove to, uh, to diagnose that. And then pharmacobezoars, which is, I guess, I've never seen that, but that's a type, I guess, uh, taking a lot of medicines and those medicines uh, accumulate and create a mass. But you have to be on, a, I suppose, on a lot of medicine for that to be the case. All right, so here's a case from Subhash Taylor. Uh, and it's a trichobezoar. You can see it's obviously here. It's taking the shape of the stomach. So here you see this is where the esophagus would be. And then here you have the, the 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 body right here, 
and it's crazy. So this is the ultrasound image. Now I'm not going to pretend to say, oh, I've, if I see this in real time on an ultrasound image, I'm going to be like, yeah, that's a, that's a bizarre. But if somebody's complaining of, you know, symptoms of some type of obstruction, you know, you can suggest it or try to, you know, use a linear probe and, and investigate further. So here you have the stomach, you have this echogenic material with some, you know, dirty shadowing. And then you have a little bit of the liver. So stomach probably going into, into pyloric, pyloris, pyloris region right there. Obviously, history can help. If you know the person has trichotillomania, then that can probably uh, help in the diagnosis of this condition. I've never seen one in real life, though. Only in case reports. All right, so again with the pyloris, we already went over that. Now let's do pyloric stenosis. So pyloric stenosis is an obstruction caused by hypertrophy of the pyloric muscle. So hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Now, the, the main symptom of this usually is projectile vomiting. Now, you're going to do a lot of pyloric ultrasounds where the patient's just maybe spitting up a little bit. But anytime a, base, a patient that's a newborn or, uh, you know, an infant comes to the ER with vomiting, could be reflux, but they're always going to order a pyloric ultrasound to rule that out. Now, the criteria for, for pyloric stenosis is greater than 3 millimeters in thickness and greater than 15 millimeters in length. That's what we use. That's what I've always used. But... There is a mnemonic for this, which is pi, right? So pi is 3.14. So the three being the thickness and the, the one four being the, the, the length. So that's a good way to remember uh, the, 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 the numbers for it. Or you can just remember 3 and 15. But uh, that's why I have here 1.5. But the pi mnemonic says 1.4. And quite frankly, the thickness of the muscle is much more important to me than the length. So another thing you can have is uh, the antral nipple sign. That is uh, mucosal heaping. That you, you can obviously see a lot if there's fluid in the antrum. If there's only air, you may not see that, but this is typically present. So you can measure from here to here for length. You see a little bit of fluid in the, in the duodenum. Though it is an obstruction because the, the pyloric channel cannot open up, some fluid can still get through. Just the majority of the contents cannot. So the patient will have failure to thrive. They will lose weight instead of gain weight, which is what they're supposed to do in the beginning of their life. So antral nipple sign is mucosal heaping. Clinically, they're going to have projectile vomiting, a palpable, palpable olive sign. Now, this is a clinical sign. Quite frankly, most patients, they come in, they're vomiting, they send them to ultrasound. They don't really do a, a, a physical exam. There was one patient I did once that was very emaciated. They had lost a lot of weight. And when you pressed on the abdomen, you can't actually feel the palpable olive sign. And this is what you're feeling, right? So this is a subcutaneous fat. This is the abdominal muscles. And right here, so this is a little bit of... A mass effect, and if you press on there, you'll feel something, and they call it the palpable olive sign. And they will have weight loss, failure to thrive, and there, there may be some laboratory findings as well. So remember, gallbladder is a good marker or a landmark for it. So here you got liver, gallbladder, pyloric muscle. You can measure from here to here. Sometimes I'll measure the entire thing just to oversell it, because if it's like three millimeters, but if you measure from here to here and it says five millimeters, the ER is going to be like, oh yeah, that's, that's real. And the surgeon's going to be like, oh yeah, we're ready to go. So this is the 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 channel where the food is supposed to go through, so the pyloric antrum, the duodenum, and then the portal splenic confluence is here, and a little bit of the the, the, the pancreas. So good landmark, pancreas and gallbladder. It should be somewhere in between that. If you're scanning, especially like right here, and there's a lot of gas, what you can do is go up and angle down, and hopefully you can kind of use the, the liver as a, as a window and scan down into the pylorus. If it's still too gassy, Left lateral decubitus might not help because air rises, and if you put them on their, on their left side, the air is going to rise towards the right, further obscuring all the right upper quadrant, which you want to see, or midline epigastric region. So if you put them in right lateral decubitus, that might help. That's helped me a lot. If they're allowed to eat, you can feed them Pedialyte or something like that to fill up their stomach with fluid and kind of displace the gas, especially if you put them on right lateral decubitus. So... It's a pretty simple exam. Another thing we do while we look while we're looking for this is we're checking the mesenteric vessels. So a little bit inferior to this to make sure that the SMA and SMV are not inverted, which is malrotation. We'll go over that later. All right, so here's a case, another case of pyloric stenosis. You see liver right here. You see the, the obliques right here. This is pyloric, very thick from here to here, very thick. Now, and this is another another thing. Pyloric stenosis, once you see it, you know it's positive. You don't have to really measure it. We measure it to have qualitative data. I'm sorry, quantitative data for the surgeon. But we know it's positive. 
Uh, some call it the little cervix sign. For those of you that do uh, transvaginal ultrasounds for cervical length, it can look a little bit like a little cervix. So that's a good sign. Here you have the antral nipple sign or the mucosal heaping. And then this is in transverse. So here's the antrum of the stomach overlapping the, the pylorus. Now there's cases where you have the pylorus in the stomach, right? And the stomach is so distended that it's kind of pushed over onto the right upper part of the abdomen and then has inverted the, the, the pylorus. So don't get confused. That's still the pylorus. It's just instead of being like this, it's gotten inverted because it's being pulled because the, the stomach is distended so much. That happened to me the other day. A lot of people are confused. They're like, oh, you're inverted. No, be aware of that. And treatment for pyloric stenosis is pyloromyotomy. I've seen uh, uh, the, the procedures done before. It's a pretty simple procedure, surgically speaking. Small incision in the epigastric region. And they cut into the muscle to allow the muscle to expand. And then over time, your, your body will create kind of like a new serosal surf surface over that. All right, here's another case. Again, antral nipple sign, fluid, and more uh, dense material in the stomach, maybe coagulated milk. And then that's the muscle, very thickened. You measure from here to here for length and a little bit of fluid in the duodenal bulb. Again, some of the superior mesenteric vein or portosplenic confluence and a little bit of the, the, the gallbladder. Intussusception. Now, we do a lot of intussusception scans and they're not quite as common as... Uh, as uh, appendicitis. Appendicitis is very common, but we do get a few cases and sometimes when we get them, they kind of roll through. We'll have uh, maybe three in a week, four in a week, and then we'll go a couple months without having one. Um, there's two types, small bowel or, yeah, small bowel or ileocolic, which is the small bowel into the colon. That's the important one. That's the one that requires a uh, therapeutic enema to try to undo the intussusception. So in transverse, you're going to have a target like lesion or a bullseye lesion or a donut, whatever. So they call it uh, telescoping because what happens is let's say, for instance, this is the cecum or this is the ascending colon and this is the, the small bowel or terminal ileum that goes into that. So it telescopes into itself. It is an obstruction usually treated with therapeutic enemas where they insulfate air into the colon through the rectum. Very uncomfortable procedure, but it's, it's very effective. If it recurs too much, they may have to have surgery. So the mean diameter, which is very important, is 2.6 centimeters. So if you have that target like lesion in the right upper quadrant and it's about three centimeters, you're, you're, you're pretty much good to go to say that's an ileocolic intussusception. In sagittal, they call it the pseudo kidney sign because you're getting the outer portion of the, of the colon. The ileum is going to be in the middle and then gonna, there's going to be mesenteric fat, which represents the sinus of the kidney and it's kind of has the shape of a kidney but you got to use your imagination a little bit so it's usually idiopathic meaning don't know they, they don't know what's causing it although most of the point is most of the time it's caused by a lead point and most of the point that lead point is a, a lymph node so you'll notice that there's lymph nodes and there's a lot of mesenteric lymph nodes scattered around and within the interception itself you have symptoms of vomiting the pain can be intermittent whereas as the peristalsis gets real intense they're crying and screaming and then as that wave of peristalsis moves on to another part of the intestine they kind of relax they look sick uh they can have current jelly stool which is pretty much uh the interceptions there for long enough it can cause uh necrosis of the of the the lining of the intestine and you can start to have diarrhea with blood and it looks like jelly um and those are the most common symptoms so first and foremost, let's go over small bowel interception. This is something that you have to learn because we get referrals all the time from outside hospitals where they're like, oh, we have an interception. I'm also on a lot of the social media sites, like, you know, sonographers do it in the dark. And a lot of people are like, oh, I found my first interception, which I understand. That's something you should be, you know, proud about because you trained, you, you were able to identify the, the structure. But it's, oh, they're like, oh, it's in the left lower quadrant. It measures one centimeter. No, I know that's small bowel. You have to be able to determine whether it's small bowel or large bowel because small bowel is transient. It's usually found incidentally. The patient's usually not in much pain, if any. It's The mean diameter is about 1.4 centimeters. Uh, location is very important. If the location is in the left lower quadrant, you know that's not ileocolic. Um, and it's usually transient. It goes away on its own. So you wait 15 to 30 minutes and it goes away. Oftentimes you'll see it kind of dissolve in front of you. So here's a panoramic view of the transverse abdomen from right to left. So here you got your rectus abdominis muscle, rectus abdominis muscle. You have your 
umbilicus region, your subcutaneous fat, obliques, a little bit of the oblique there, and you have this lesion here, and this one here, and then some small bowel with a little bit of kind of like artifact from the from the from the movement as I'm trying to do the panoramic, and then maybe another one here. So we're gonna say this patient has three iliocolic interceptions. No, they have two or three small bowel interceptions. You wait and they uh they, they go away. And sometimes this one goes away and then a new one will come. Now you can't have both. I've had patients where they have an iliocolic interception and a left lower quadrant small bowel interception. So it's very, very, very important. You see it's kind of small. When you compare it to a large or iliocolic interception, you'll notice the difference. So here's another case. You got a right upper quadrant one, which is a good place. So if it's right upper quadrant, that's usually where iliocolic interceptions are. But in this case, it was not. You can notice that it's not very big, 1.7 centimeters. It's a tiny bit of mesoteric fat there. The inner inner portion of the interception is another part of bowel. There's no lymph nodes. There's no lesions. Here's the gallbladder. And then this is an sagittal. It looks pretty big in sagittal, but it's still tip of the liver. And then 15 minutes later, it was gone. And the patient was happily sitting there and not complaining or anything. So small bowel interception does not require treatment. It, when it's found and, and documented, it leads to so many more ultrasounds because then all the parents here and all the ER hears is there was an interception it went away if you ever have any symptoms come back and you'll see it I, you can predict it they will come back every week for like the next few months which i guess is fine for the hospital they're trying to make money but it sucks for the parents so they think their son or their daughter has uh, an interception or an obstruction in their intestine every time they, they cry so iliocolic interception this is the one that's important for us not that the other one's not important but this one's more important ter so iliocolic interception, that's when the ilium goes into the colon. So the ilium would be called the intersusceptum. And then the colon or ascending colon would be called intersuscepience because that's the part that's receiving the intersusception. Since the intersusception usually goes pretty high up into the, like, the hepatic flexure, you're going to see it in the right upper quadrant typically. It can be very big. It can go all the way to the transverse colon and you'll see it in the epigastric region as well. So remember, interception, remember the movie Inception? It's like a dream within a dream. Well, interception is like a bowel within a bowel. Well, it's not like, it is bowel within a bowel. It's a good way to remember it, a little, little jokey mnemonic. Okay, so is this a clip? Yeah, so here you have, again, tip of the liver, so you know we're in the right of a quadrant. You have a bigger target-like lesion. You can see there's a little lymph node there, some mesenteric fat, and then the internal portion, which is the ilium. So 2.9 centimeters and about three, let me see, let's go back. And 3.7 centimeters in diameter, so it's big. And you can see all the little lymph nodes inside of it. And you can see how much bigger this is. And this, this is in a sagittal. You can see the ilium there going in, lymph nodes, and then the pseudo kidney sign. So you can see the difference from that and a small bowel interception. And that's the size again. So I only included one clip. Hmm. All right, so let me go into my files. Give me one second. So here's another one, iliocolic interception in the right upper quadrant. You see the gallbladder right here, and you can see the, the ilium in the inside, some mesoteric fat. Let's see, about 2.7 centimeters. And you can actually see the ilium going into the, the what would be the pseudo kidney sign. Oftentimes you can't see the appendix as well. So this might even be a little bit of the appendix. So just like the appendix can go into interception, the appendix can also go into a, uh, into a inguinal hernia, which is called an amiant hernia, I think. So pseudo kidney sign. You see, it does have the reniform shape a little bit. You got you to gotta squint a little bit though. A little lymph node. Panoramic. Another lymph node there. Pseudo kidney sign, very long. So this one was all the way into the epigastric. So this is a very large iliocolic interception. Another one. See the ilium here. Mesenteric fat. Lymph node. That's just a little drawing I did. Here's another one. This is, I think, with the 15 megahertz probe, so you can really see the, the, the tissues. So colon, colon, mesentery, uh, lymph node, and ilium. And this is a nice, that's that same one in transverse, so tip of the liver here. Iliocolic interception. So you see the ilium is much different in appearance than the thicker colon and then the mesenteric fat. All right, so you get the point.
So please, please, please remember the difference between ileocolic and small bowel size. Small bowel is usually about 1.5 centimeters, one centimeters, whereas ileocolic is usually right over quadrant, about 2.5 to 3 centimeters in transverse diameter. Very, very important. Remember, if you see lymph nodes inside of it, that's a good sign. That is an ileocolic intussusception. Now, I don't know if I, if I have other slides, but I think I do. Uh, uh, ileocolic intussusception can also be caused by Meckel's diverticulum, which I think I have slides about that. It can also be, if the patient is very old, I forgot to mention, ileocolic intussusception is usually seen in toddlers, right? Two, three years, a few months, old, about that range. We usually see it in toddlers. Now, if the kid's 11, 14, 18, and they have an ileocolic intussusception, most likely it's caused by some other pathology, like a, a mass, some type of neoplasm. Quite frankly, usually a, a polyp and also frequently Meckel's diverticulum. So keep that in mind. All right, so Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease, autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease of the intestines. Uh, it's about 200 cases a year, maybe less than 200,000 cases a year. Uh, it can affect any part of the gastrointestinal system, but very frequently starts uh, with inflammation at the terminal ileum or the ileocecal junction can have pancolitis. You can have your entire colon that's uh, swollen, that rhymes. And common in symptoms include, like any other gastrointestinal disease, abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, anemia, and fatigue. Now, one of the findings you can see with ultrasound, if you have bowel wall thickening and what's thickening and what's called creeping fat, that's uh, suggestive of Crohn's disease. Obviously, they need to be worked up. For Crohn's disease, you can't diagnose the ultrasound, but you can at least suggest it. Now, creeping fat, the mesenteric fat is usually between the loops of bowel like this. If there's a lot of echogenic fat, which is fat stranding or fat edema, those two terms are interchangeable, that's circumferential or wrapping around the colon, that's considered creeping fat and a sign of uh, Crohn's disease. So here's a 11-year-old with severe, I spelled severe wrong, sorry about that, abdominal pain and vomiting. So you can see a transverse view of what looks like small bowel, and then you can see the echogenic fat is all around, this might be a little lymph node here, all around the bowel and some free fluid, a little bit of ascites. The bowel is also hyperemic. Remember, hyperemia means hyper increased. Emia means blood or presence in blood. So increased blood flow, usually a sign of inflammation. So hyperemia, free fluid, and creeping fat. This patient did have Crohn's disease. Here's another patient with Crohn's disease, panoramic view. You can see the ileocecal junction is right here. You kind of see where it narrows here. That's the junction. Very, very, very distended small bowel or ileum, tiny bit of appendix right here, echogenic fat all around. You see more here, all around, all around circumferentially, a little bit of free fluid, a little bit of ascites. The echogenic fat went all up into the right upper quadrant. And here you see it around the bowel with a little bit of free fluid. This was another case of colon, of uh, Crohn's disease. Now, quite frankly, the there's not really a lot of bowel wall thickening here. There is a lot of uh, inflammation of the fat. You can have some severe bowel wall thickening with Crohn's as well and hyperemia. Okay. Necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, important condition present in, in a, usually in premature infants, is present in one to three per 1,000 uh, live births. Over 90% of the patients that have necrotizing enterocolitis are premature infants. Um, necrotizing enterocolitis usually leads to ischemia and necrosis. Once that happens, you start to develop a uh, you know, dead bowel, and within the bowel wall, you start to develop gas, so little air bubbles, which is the term for that is pneumatosis intestinalis. Now those little air bubbles get picked up by the mesenteric vessels, and then they go up into the portal vein. So you will see also portal venous gas, or little bubbles within the portal vein, and can affect any part of the intestines. And it, if not found early, or if it's pretty global, can be uh, pretty fatal. So mortality is from 10 to 50%, depending on where you find the data. So here we got a abdominal x-ray with some lines. You can see the, the colon here, and all these little bubble lucencies is within the wall of the intestine. That's uh, pneumatosis intestinalis. Now, this patient had air within the portal vein branches. Very important to differentiate this from pneumobilia. Pneumobilia will be branching air, but within the bile ducts, and it's usually post some type of procedure. Whereas this, you can see the air is within the portal vein, and there's a ton of air. And you can see 
there's not, at least in this image here, there's not a lot, but there's a couple areas of echogenicities within the bowel wall. That's pneumatosis intestinalis. Here's a clip. Where's the plague? There it is. So here's a clip of in pneumatosis intestinalis with the laparoscopic view. You got some common tail artifacts there. And this is the gastric wall here. Here's a longitudinal panoramic view showing the bladder, some relatively anechoic free fluid, and more egogenic free fluid here. And you got bowel, just in the bowel, with egogenicities within the bowel wall. Here's a clip of the bowel within the right lower quadrant with echogenesis all within the bowel wall. This is air. So here's the liver. And you see right there, you see these little air bubbles going through the portal, portal veins. That's portal venous gas. This is a result of pneumatosis intestinalis, which is gas within the bowel wall. Here you got some common tail. And there you can see all these little bubbles with air on the surface of the intestine. So when it's that widespread, it's it's pretty a pretty ominous finding. If it's, you know, local localized the the prognosis is usually better now with ultrasound it can be very difficult because if the lumen of the bowel is filled with fecal matter and gas you can't really find the differentiation from that air and what would be a uh, a mural area of air so when the bowel is filled with fluid it it allows for better detection of pneumatosis intestinalis uh, abdominal x-ray is a little better uh, also you can't see free fluid so that's another important finding so if the ultrasound is not a, they'll usually do the abdominal x-ray first anyways. And sometimes with the abdominal x-ray, if they do find those little lucencies, you can kind of follow that and see if you can follow the same area to find that. But with ultrasound, it can be a little difficult. Now the portal venous gas, pretty easy to see. So that's a good thing to, to look at the portal vein, take you know pictures with and without color, uh, show the liver parenchyma because the liver could become pretty, you know, filled with little air bubbles throughout the portal veins and the you know, the portal of vein branches. All right, Henoch Scheinlein purpura. Now, this is a, a systemic vasculitis. Now, this doesn't look like a gastrointestinal disease. Uh, the most, it's a rare disease, but we do see it in our hospital quite frequently. Uh, the most common sign of this disease would be a rash in the lower extremities, which is a purpura. Now, this can affect all organs, including the skin, the liver, the kidneys and the intestines the, when the intestines do get uh, affected you'll have small bowel thickening so the 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 intestine the small intestine will be thickened and inflamed you'll have hyperemia what happens there that vasculitis those little vessels can rupture and create a mural hematoma so then there's bleeding into the into the intestinal wall now when you have bleeding into the intestinal wall if that is in the terminal ilium and it happens just like a lymph node, it gets caught in that peristalsis wave, it can create an ileocolic intussusception. Quite frankly, you usually don't see an ileocolic intussusception, but it can lead to that. What you will see is a lot of small bowel wall thickening with hyperemia and maybe some, uh, and maybe some um, ascites. And here's a case. You see the small bowel right here, very thick. You see the gut signature. Remember, submucosal is the echogenic middle layer. A little bit of, I wouldn't really call that hyperemia, just a small, small amount of vessels, probably normal, but it is thickened and you'll see a lot of these little like donuts throughout, especially in the hypogastric region. Uh, I remember I had a case a few weeks ago and I saw these findings in the intestines. They had ordered an ultrasound for, for an abdomen complete, I think. And I happened to notice there was some bowel wall thickening. I went to look at the legs and sure enough, there was a rash in the legs. So I told the, the radiologist, the radiologist told the ER and then the ER work the patient up and they did turn out to have Henoch Shineland purpura. So it's good to know these things because otherwise it would have been a normal abdominal ultrasound had I not noticed that and they would have been discharged home because they were wearing pants and we all know how uh, how well they do physical exams nowadays. All right, let me stop. Let me stop. Here's another case. Bowel wall thickening. You see the submucosis much more patchy. So that's edema. It looks like a donut, right? So this is the antrum of the stomach. Very thick, right? From here to here, very thick. So thickening of the antrum of the stomach, hyperemia. So this is another patient that had henoch shineland purpura. You see it's a 12-year-old male with bowel wall thickening. See the bowel wall is greater than five or almost five millimeters. Usually two to three millimeters is the upper limits for bowel wall thickening. A little bit more for the large intestine, a little bit less for the, for the small intestine. And about two millimeters for the appendix, the wall thickening. All right, so Meckel's diverticulum. So this is a 
very common congenital anomaly of the of the intestines. It happens from incomplete obliteration of the vitelline duct from our fetuses or feti, whatever. And so what's left over is this finger-like projection off of the ilium. It can lead to bleeding and it can lead to interception because it can act as a, as a lead point, much like a lymph node or some other type of lesion. And a thing to remember, a mnemonic for Nemeckel's diverticulum is the rule of twos. So 2% of the population is usually about two inches long. It's usually two feet from the ileocecal junction and usually is found before two years of age. So here's a patient that had an intussusception, right? But their intussusception looked rather weird. They had this stuff here, which doesn't look like intestine. It doesn't look like mesenteric fat. And intussusceptions usually typically don't have a lot of uh, fluid inside of them. So that's another, and here you see a little finger-like projection. Now, uh, ultrasound is hard to detect Meckel's diverticulum, but if you have a case, I had one 11-year-old once that had a Meckel's, but we didn't know he was 11. He had an ileocolic intussusception, which is rare for that age. And they tried to read, I remember I did see an intussusception. The intussusception did have fluid within it. And there was a little suggestion of a finger-like projection within that fluid. So I, I recommended, I told the radiologist my findings. He didn't think it was that. They tried a, to reduce the intussusception with an enema several times, kept on failing. It turned out he had a medical Meckel's diverticulum, but at least the radiologist called me the next day. He said, hey, good job. You, you totally nailed that one. So here you got an ileocolic intussusception. This one doesn't really have that fluid, maybe a little bit right here, but there is this little finger-like projection right here. And it can very easily look like a regular ileocolic intussusception, but instead of intestine, that's more like a mass. And if you put color Doppler, you'll have internal flow. You don't really see any lymph nodes there. This might be small bowel right here and mesenteric fat. 10-month-old female turned out to have an ileocolic interception after many, many reductions attempts. All right, so these are the things we see with large intestine, interception, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulosis, diverticulitis. It's a hard diagnosis with ultrasound, especially diverticulosis. But diverticulitis could be a little easier because you have the inflammatory component of it. You have an outpouching of the bowel. Sometimes you have a little fecalith inside that bowel and uh, hyperemia. All right, colitis, you know, colitis is just an umbrella term for infl inflammation of the colon. It can be caused from autoimmune diseases like ulcerative, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's or infectious diseases by many, many, many bacteria and viruses. What you're going to have is bowel wall thickening. Remember, middle layers, submucosa, you see how thick the bowel wall is and the predominance of the submucosa. All right, 13-year-old female, she had campylobacter colitis. They're usually going to present with vomiting, diarrhea, uncontrollable diarrhea too, usually. And they're usually going to order a, an appendix ultrasound. Appendix was normal, but a lot of bowel wall thickening. You see a panoramic view of the entire ascending colon. This is the lower pole of the right kidney and the tip of the, of the, uh, of the liver. And this is descending colon. Same thing. He had colitis. This is a young man. The entire, I did a panoramic of the entire colon. Here's about sigmoid. You have your transversus abdominis and, uh, or your oblique muscles here. And you can see very thickened uh, bowel wall with submucosal thickening. All right, so mesenteric adenitis, I'm going to try to uh, go a little fast because I am running out of time. Mesenteric adenitis is just uh, like a diagnosis of, uh, of uh, exclusion. Everything else is normal. There's no ileitis. There's no appendicitis. There's no colitis. There's no ascites. There's could be a little bit of ascites, but you'll notice a lot of very enlarged lymph, not very enlarged, but enlarged lymph nodes in the specifically in the right lower quadrant usually. It would be a cluster. They have to measure greater than five millimeters. They will have hyperemia to the lymph node. Uh, there can be tenderness if you press with the uh, with the transducer. Can mimic appendicitis. In fact, 20% of patients who do have appendicitis also have mesenteric adenitis. And here's just that view. Here you can see the psoas muscle right here, iliac vessels, artery and vein. And you can see a little cluster of lymph nodes right there, right there. If you put color Doppler there, they will light up with color. Quite frequently seen in little kids. Again, psoas muscle here. Frequent finding. All right, so the vermiform appendix, we're not going to uh, go over the appendix because I have another appendix talk. But it doesn't do anything except leak poison. I think my box is, is blocking that. <laughs> All right, duplication cysts or enteric duplication cysts is a rare congenital anomaly. This is usually just a cystic structure that's attached to the, the intestine, any part of the intestine. Uh, it usually does have histiologically... Uh, uh, gut signature. So it does have gastrointestinal tissue. Um, uh, it can occur in the ileum, the esophagus, the colon, or any other part of the, of the intestine. 
and there may be uh, nausea, vomiting, bleeding, perforation, or obstruction. So here we have a young woman with, uh, this was in the pelvic region, so this has to be differentiated between a, uh, an ovarian cyst because that's a more common finding in young women. But here you have a cystic structure and you have fluid, fluid levels, so some debris and more anechoic fluid. And then here's another view showing that fluid, fluid level. Now, what we do have here is a gut signature. So usually uh, ovarian or an exocyst are going to be more thin-walled. They may have septations or not, but they're usually going to be thin-walled. Whereas this is a thicker wall and you can see the gut signature, including the submucosal middle layer. So this was a, an enteric duplication cyst. And here's a smaller one. It's about 2.4 centimeters. There may be a little bit of air in this portion of the wall here. There as well. There actually is air there. So this is a smaller one found incidentally. This is a little bit small bowel right here. So this is in the hypogastric region. Now, you got to make sure it also fluid fluid levels. So you got to make sure this is not just, you know, some bowel that's filled with fluid and peristalsing. You know, stay on it. Look at it. Put color Doppler. See if there's a, flu if there's a flow to it. And it's often fine. It's, it's often an incidental finding. I think I have a clip here. So here we have an infant with weight loss and vomiting. So infant with vomiting, they're going to order a pyloric ultrasound always. Oh, this has music too. I see a pyloric ultrasound ordered to rule out hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So the pylorus was normal. You see air right here. This is the pylorus. It's thin walled. You see the fluid kind of moving, but it can't get past this big cyst right here. So this cyst was there at the end, probably at the duodenum. You see it has gut signature and it was causing kind of like a mechanical obstruction post pylorus. So here you got your pancreas, your kidney, and the duodenum is kind of squashed there. So the fluid can get through, the food can get through, it's going to go the other way out the, out the mouth with projectile vomiting. So that was an enteric duplication cyst. So they're rare. You can read that. I can't, I can't speak that fast, I don't think. So remember, the lining of the, of, the, of the cyst has to have gut signature for you to consider a uh, enteric duplication cyst. All right, so small bowel obstruction. Now, with ultrasound, you can uh, uh, suggest small bowel obstruction for sure. Um, there's often free fluid associated with small bowel obstruction. So small bowel obstruction is an obstruction of the small bowel. What happens, it could be a mass that's causing a stricture of the obstruction. It could be adhesions. It could be many things, but anything you know before that is going to be very distended, filled with fluid. You're going to have a diameter greater than 2.5 centimeters of the actual bowel as it's filled with fluid. You're going to have what's called the two of fro movement. So there's not going to be a whole bunch of peristalsis because the, the, the intestine is so, so uh, how do you say, distended. That it's not going to be any per, uh, peristalsis. The fluid is just going to be there kind of sitting back and forth. And they call this uh, poo and fro. I spelled fro wrong. So poo and fro or two and fro. Um, you can see the plicae circularis of the small bowel. And they call that the keyboard sign because it looks like a bunch of little finger-like projections. You can have bowel edema. Again, you can have ascites. Distally collapsed portion of the bowel can be considered a, uh, uh, a transition point where the obstruction is. And again, free fluid is associated. I mentioned that a few times. And, I spoke. and it's associated with a, a poorer prognosis. So here we have a, an example of small bowel obstruction. So you can see the, the fluid. You can see the plicae circularis. You see the fluid just right there. You see them right there. You see a fluid is just kind of going back and forth, not really propelling forward here too. You see the fluid is just do, do, to and fro or poo and fro if you want to remember that. I think it's a good mnemonic because it's poo. <laughs> so here's the plicae circularis. And this was a small bowel obstruction. Um, oddly enough, this case was an interesting one because I did find the transition point and there was uh, about a two centimeter lesion there. It looked like it was part of the bowel. They um, they did a CT, and on the CT you could actually see it, but since the CT was, I think, for something else, they really didn't mention it. So I told the radiologist, I was like, hey, this patient had a small bowel obstruction and looked like on a mass, so I was causing the obstruction. So then they had us repeat the ultrasound. The patient was actually feeling better. The obstruction had gone away. So whatever, maybe the pressure had finally caused the fluid to go past that transition point. And... Uh, 
they discharge the patient home. I kept on pushing for it because I was like, hey, bring this patient back, you know, have them come back because there's a mass there. And it turned out to be, I think it was an adenocarcinoma of the, of the bowel there, I think, that was causing the small bowel obstruction. But, you know, they, had, they came back several times and finally did an MRI, thankfully. All right, mid-gut volvulus, very important. It's a congenital malrotation of the gut. So, you know, when we're fetus, when we are fetuses, your gut goes out about the 11th to 12th week or so, and it goes out into the umbilicus, it rotates, and then it comes back. Failure of that to happen becomes uh, omphalocele. But sometimes that does that rotation doesn't happen, and the gut does come back in. So that's malrotation. Uh, 75% case, percent of cases are present within a month of birth. And then 90% within a year. So usually you're going to see it in, in infants to young babies. You're going to have a whirlpool sign or corkscrew sign, especially with color Doppler. You're going to have a version of the SMA and SMV. So a good way to rule that out is just to go to the portal splenic confluence and go down. You're going to see the SMA, aorta, SMV, and the inferior vena cava. If the SMV is on this side, you have malrotation. And then you could also kind of go up and down and see if you have that whirlpool with color Doppler to diagnose make good volvulus. So this twisting and bowel obstruction can re re result in ischemia and then necrosis. So it's a surgical emergency. Here's a clip of it. So here in the center, you have the superior mesenteric artery right there. And then you see the whirlpool around it. It's like a little hurricane. You see some distended bowel over here. Right there. And then with color, you have the, the typical whirlpool sign. Now, any any volvulus or any twisting of a structure, ovarian torsion, testicular torsion, you can't find a, a volvulus. Usually the pedicle that's wrapped around a main structure, you will put color doppler and you will see a whirlpool sign. All right, so here is a, a different case. Uh, this is a, an 11 year old that came in for regular quadrant pain, normal labs, no fever. No vomiting. They just had pain in the right lower quadrant. They ordered an appendix ultrasound. The appendix was normal. Here's some right lower quadrant images. You can see a little bit of the fundus of the uterus and just echogenic fat. Now, when I see this, I start looking for appendix because usually when you have appendicitis, you have echogenic fat, which is fat stranding or fat edema around the appendix, which, uh, so what I do is I look for the appendix. I did find the appendix in this patient. It was normal. So they just had this fat, echogenic fat. Now, this, now here is a CT showing the this area here which corresponds to this and this was a epiploic appendagitis so remember earlier i men mentioned the epiploic appendages on the colon uh but it's typically seen in obese males in their fourth or fifth decade of life this is a young female and the clinical findings are usually just pain acute non-migrating most commonly associated in the low left forward quadrant now this was i think a sigmoid colon epiploic and the sigmoid colon just happened to be much more further on to the left side so usually there's no other symptoms, but there is. It could be fever, nausea, vomiting, bowel habit changes, changes. But usually it's just right lower quadrant or left lower quadrant or lower quadrant pain. Laboratory findings are usually normal. You can have some some leukocytosis, a little bit of white blood cell elevation. You can have increased C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker, or it could just be normal. And since it mimics appendicitis, you know they need to do a CT to, to confirm it's not appendicitis or some other you know diverticulitis or something like that. And the management is conservative. This goes away on its own. Here's a, another case. Five-month male, intermittent abdominal pain for three days. So here, liver. You can see you have an ileocolic intussusception. Pseudo kidney sign. So you can see the intussusception there. Very nice. A little bit of hyperemia in the area. Some free fluid which the longer the interception goes, it can present with free fluid. Now, this patient also had an appendicitis. So they had a twofer. They had uh, ileocolic interception and an appendicitis. So in this case, they just took him to surgery and re you know, removed the appendix and then reduced the ileocolic interception as opposed to trying to do an, uh, an enema reduction because they had a surgical, a surgical diagnosis and then a quasi-surgical diagnosis. So... Rare, rare case to find both of them together. And then lastly, here we have a kid who came in with, you know, vomiting and abdominal pain, cramping. So they ordered interception. Interception was normal. However, and here you have the bladder and posterior to the bladder, you have this torpedo-like structure. Now I was confused. Here you see a little bit of uterus. 
So I was like, my God, did this patient like swallow something? This is a foreign body that's worked their way through the... So I told the mom, does the baby, you know, put stuff in their mouth? There's a one-year-old female. So I kept on asking other questions and I was like, is there any reason why there would be something... Hold on one second. Why there would be a foreign body in the rectum? Because this is obviously not an anatomical structure. It's very, very perfect. And the mom did tell me that right before she came in that she had put a, a suppository in uh, the patient's rectum. So there you go. That's what it looks like in real time. And it's a suppository. I think I have another one. Okay, so this is another interesting case. I read a uh, journal article on the, I don't remember what journal it was. I think it might have been Annals, Annals of Emergency Medicine or something like that. And uh, it was a case of a teenager who had uh, presented with abdominal pain. They did an ultrasound. They noticed in the stomach there was uh, these little circular structures. And uh, it turned out to be, so here, okay, so here's, then one of my uh, followers on Instagram uh, attempted to repeat it, w worked very well. And then another of my followers, they were actually doing a test on MRI and she wanted to test it on MRI and here it is on MRI again. So a lot of little circular structures in the stomach. And this turned out to be uh, boba tea, boba tea balls. So I've never had one of these. I don't know what it tastes like, but I guess some people just swallow it and they swallow the balls whole. Sorry about that. And uh, that's what it looks like on ultrasound. So I thought that was a pretty cool case. So if you ever see a stomach filled with little circular structures that are hypoechoic and then hyperechoic in the center, ask the patient, have you had a boba tea? I've never had one. I got to try one. So that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, ultrasound, as usual, is very effective, cost effective. It's portable, you know, much to our chagrin. We got sometimes got to go up to the ICUs to do it, but that's fine. It costs a lot less than MRI and CT. And there's no ionizing radiation. So it's uh, it's quite the effective tool at diagnosis gastrointestinal diseases. Now, you know me from Sonographic Tendencies. You can go to my website, sonographictendency.com, and follow me on Facebook, Twitter. I know Twitter doesn't look like that anymore. Now it's a, an X, I think. YouTube, TikTok, all that stuff. I don't have Instagram here, but mostly I think I'm most active on Instagram, right? Thank you so much, and stay tuned for the appendix talk. Bye.